from your butt all the way down here. You have to keep your feet on the floor and walk around here. to choke. Some people trap the arm out of reflex, but if you bring your chin in, they're not getting in your trachea. Mm -hmm. Some people, however, I'll just take my head off for one sec. Some people, however, although their arm is wide like that, will start to flex the wrist, and they have good intelligence with that bone, and they'll get you in the trachea with that. And that's what you'd like to be. You'd like to be the guy that can trap the arm fully, 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 and I'll start to get it in. Ah, yeah. So that's tight. So now here, I can come up for a little bit of assistance, but it's not going to give me much. This is what I got to look at. This hand is ultimately limiting me. So I need to put pressure on my shoulder so that I'm able to rotate and take it up to the center. Squeeze it. But it's not easy. All my weight goes on my shoulder. And then I need to see if I can get this inside. From here, I can hop it under the grip sometimes. So now I have this hand. You can work the fingers, but you can also just keep it there because as he chokes, now I can literally hold it away. So he doesn't have as good a choke. And that's not yet using this. I can use this. I can work against the grip. I can also work up the inside. Take the choke off from there because my arm has effectively done this. Get him out. Yes, sir. Thanks. Don't be sorry. <laughs> Point the hand, rotate. It will get stuck here. Right, so then I have to lever away to get it inside. Under the hands. The other hand can help. And I can start to work here. The slide out. A second option, as I'm in that position, is as I start to move, sometimes just by putting my hand on the floor, I can make space. If the fingers are pointing towards his body, I can leave her further than if they're outwards. Just squeeze hard. Keep my arms stuck to your ribs. Yeah, so it doesn't have much room. So I start to see if I can make space. And as I do these little openings, sometimes this thing can help to pull the grip. And I look to see if that gives me enough of an opening here. when I work in this way I start to make space I put my shoulder down and I can see if I can 
start to use my body on his grip here. Or my hand underneath, so I just have to pull my elbow up. Once my elbow is out, say how it's above, if I hold his back and I push out, it gives me leverage. So he lock your hands tight. Yeah. Once the elbow is out, this gives you a good amount of leverage against his grip. It will pull the choke more tightly into the artery on the one side. But it's going to open your trach now. So from that position, I'm going to get inside again. <clears throat> choke, choke. I start here, no go, go. I start here up on his back. I lean. I start to work. Fingers going inward. I start to create leverage against his arm. I can pull. That's not enough. I can shrug out with the head. If the head is not an option, it's still too tight. He's too under the trachea. I can look to even use my leg and pull my elbow out here. And then once I keep jumping, jumping, yeah. Once that's here, I can go back to this if you still have your choke. Most of the time, in freeing the arm, however you choose to do it, you're going to escape the choke entirely. Sometimes he'll reattach and bring you back to this position. Does that make sense? Try, try. It's not a mistake. taking a look at our five essential leg clinch takedowns and these will include the Japanese head spear takedown or Japanese double where the head is aligned with the center of the body and one hand is on each leg the double takedown the conventional with your head to the outside of the person's hip or leg the split takedown with one hand out and one hand in across the body the two on one with two hands on one leg and the three on one with two arms and a leg snaring it now these are five essential pieces of the ground game of vocabulary. There are many follow-ups and counters and blends and additions, and I will show you some here, but having some basic sense of these takedowns is important from an, uh, an attack point point of view because they are so essential and even more so from a defense point of view because even somebody with basic wrestling or basic rugby or football skill will instinctively try to attack your legs Uh, tackle your legs in one of these manners and in order to go to the final attribute for this level which is take take down defense it's important that we have some sense of how to apply the attack let us get into it to date in our requirements the majority of our structure breaking has focused on on attacking the body fairly high high up. We've looked at, at a fundamental level, how to use the baseline, how to stumble an opponent, how to create voids and densities, sweeping voids in the majority of cases, or destroying densities. We looked at how we could split the base to affect the base of sustenance and cause the base to become wider than is comfortable and the center lower than is manageable to create losses of balance. We've looked at triangulation and this idea of creating straight paths to the ground and we look, we've looked at the use of leverage. Now all three of these affectations are going to come into play when we begin addressing lower leg attacks. And we're going to be looking at five essential lower leg attacks but they're all going to essentially begin from our posture and from our stance. So for a quick review, we want to make sure that we have the majority of our mass and our weight on our front leg and that back heel absolutely loaded. Again, it doesn't mean that it can't touch to some degree, depending on what stance you're in, but it needs to be dynamic. The front heel is also quite light and it's always able to pucker and fluctuate. And from that posture, I should practice displacing and moving. Now the absolute key to learning to enter into an opponent's space is the change of 
height, the change of level. And by this, we refer to about a 50% capacity squat. 50% of that height going down by plunging straight, plunging into our structure. So if my heel is up somewhat in my default stance, it is up more in my entry stance. The idea here is that I want to lower myself under the line of the aggressor's attacks. The aggressor is going to be looking. They're going to be assuming my head and my body are in certain positions and heights. And when I squat, I change that expectation. In our striking work, we'll oftentimes fire strikes. And while most people have the desire to reach, elongate, and lengthen the body, thereby making the head more vulnerable and extending their lever, we would prefer to ratchet down and deepen our stance so that we become a, a harder target, more defensible, more compressed, the lever of our neck more hidden from the opponent and getting our power from the root from the legs. As we move now, we just want to see that we can, in, in effect, squat, shuck ourselves, shrug into our turtle shell, hide in our tank, and work from that position. Now, this is the most important point, and it applies directly to the ground flow work that you've seen previously in level three mobility. As I go downward, the first 50% occurs with a loaded heel. But anything beyond that should not occur with the heel up. And you'll commonly see this mistake, which will essentially first smash my patella into the ground, which in a singular instance can be injurious, but certainly over a prolonged period of time is not healthy for your knees. But even more important than that, by going down in a straight path, we're relying sheerly on musculature. The muscles are very prone to fatigue. In fact, just because of, of fear and anxiety and heightened states after a few seconds of engagement, sometimes you can find yourself in a very escalated state, you're breathing, racing, your body lactic, and as you go to move, your legs feel like stone. Even in sparring, after a minute of intense go and exchange, you can find yourself fatiguing. And if you've done more protracted work, longer rounds of grappling or striking, you've all been in a circumstance where you just feel exhausted. So we want to rely on effective biomechanics to bring us in. What that means is that the first 50% of the squat is going to occur muscularly by plunging into our structure. But as I go past that, I'm essentially going into a modified Cossack stance, which means my front heel is going to lift up, being propelled by the coccyx, by the hip pan, and as the hips go forward, I'm pivoting off the inside of the back toe and migrating that patella safely to the outside. First, that's going to protect the kneecap from direct impact on the ground, but more than that, it's going to begin relying increasingly on the connective tissue of the body. This is not a muscular position. This is a connective tissue elastic position. And this, in this position when we bounce, we're relying upon the stored elastic capacity intrinsic in the tissue. The elasticity of your tissue is slower to improve than the flexibility of your muscle, but it lasts longer and it stays with you longer. It's more reliable. In states of exhaustion and even in states of conditioning, it's not something you need to maintain as vigorously or as often as muscular stretching. As you begin to invite your body to explore these types of positions and your flexibility and awareness increase, the elasticity will also increase. And it's a far more reliable ally in a fight, particularly when you find yourself up against extreme loads, heavy backpacks, large opponents pushing you down, or exhaustion and fatigue. So I want to see again that that first 50% is just me squatting. And the squat can occur by deepening the rotation of the back leg. The squat can occur by slightly extending or displacing my front leg, or it can occur just on the spot by going down. Generally, there is some closing of the groin, some rotation here to stretch the leg, rather than just keeping the leg prone. And it's a very important drill to perform. If I keep myself in this loaded back posture, but I just squat on the spot, sometimes that can be a little bit demanding on the meniscus of the knee. So I want to rotate the thigh over, and now this too becomes slightly more elastic than muscular. It protects my groin, it loads my body, and it sets me up to spring in other directions with that so-called crescent step, like you might see in basic karate with that crescent step to this place. So I want to practice closing and opening the hips. From a tactical perspective, closing and opening the hips also begins laying the groundwork for the twisted lead. And that allows me to probe and get deeper and get over that reflex that we term fear fencing, that desire to 
pillow fight and slap fight with the front hand. So closing and opening, closing and opening. Now from that closed low position, I take a little gravity step with that front foot, roll the hip even more forward, lift up the heel, and migrate the toes outward. So at first, this is a tremendous stretch. If you're not used to it, it's a good idea to stay in that position for a little while, slide forward, allow the other knee to touch, and then to come up. This is also an important point of distinction. We refer often to what's termed a giant step in grappling, which is this desire, this, this idea that after the completion of my first shoot, my first entry, if it's insufficient, I can slide forward with the knee and come up. And many people will ask, am I expected on that second knee as well to come down on the inside and have the patella out? Absolutely not. It's simply on the first down where there's a lot of impact. And it's that impact that I need to migrate. The second knee touch is far more forgivable and far lighter if that occurs, even on cement. So initially, all I want to see is this in my first posture, and then any continuance will be a matter of having failed the initial takedown or uh, having a need to migrate to a secondary uh, walk or throw. Now, in the previous section, I, I alluded to the ground flow that we learned in level, uh, level three. And when I said it, I said, oops, I think I'm wrong. It's actually level two. Uh, if we refer to that Cossack ground flow or the Cossack gun crawl. And we're going to revisit it here in the context of this. We, we show this in level two as well. But this idea that when I shoot in, I have the level change. As I go through that bottom 50%, I roll forward with the tailbone. Toes are out. And then I'm ready to go forward. But if for any reason I need to call it off, I'm receiving knees or I'm getting hit. I can migrate over the foot and sit back in a hunter squat. So that basic retreat into the hunter squat and the advance into the Cossack is a very good isolation to perform. Sometimes you'll be on the ground, you'll be grabbing the leg, you need power, tailbone wants to curl under and up, and I'm going to usually displace the front foot, rocking from the heel, rolling on the ball of the foot, tailbone opening. So that fundamental motion is essential. You need to drill it. It needs to become second nature. You can do it with weights if it's manageable. If you cannot turn all the way over with the heel down at the beginning, it is fine. The heel can be somewhat up. If you cannot sit all the way down, that is fine as well. You can work it very softly as long as you have the intent of rotating somewhat out and rotating somewhat in. Primarily contacting with the inside of the big toe, primarily contacting with the instep of the foot. And that basic exercise needs to be done permissibly, kindly, respectfully. Respect those limits all the time. So I see that shoot is happening, the tail is out. When I, when I want to retreat now, because all my mass is forward, I'm mostly on the back knee that allows me to lift and tuck. If ever from this position I needed to go down, I have my arm screw, I can return to my back screw, my circle sit up, I can fight from the ground, use my legs, pull guard or whatever I need. If I need to come up, arm screw in reverse, up to a hunter squat, migrate to a Cossack. If I'm coming up from the Cossack, back up into a full stance. So it's a very nice, simple progression that takes the previous three levels and compresses them into a very direct tactical application. Addressing the five essential leg clinches, I am going in order of distance, zones, sectors, not in order of probability. In order of probability, the highest default preference, highest, uh, you know, the, the ideal choice is to keep my head to the outside of the opponent, jamming on the far side of the thigh, and then to address the legs in one of the last three or four takedowns. But if we talk about sectoring and zoning, oftentimes I'll find myself stuck inside the opponent. It's difficult for me to slip to the outside. They're throwing punches rather like a funnel, keeping my head inside. And so I don't have time to slip to the outside and go in with my body. And I choose instead simply to drop levels right on the spot and to drive in. And this head, the forehead, is literally going to spear into my opponent's pubis. So the argument for this will always be, yeah, but your head's on the inside. Can't you get knee to the face? Your head can always get knee to the face. It can always get uh, punched it can always get caught. Everything is possible. It's a matter of choosing the right tool for the right job. So the head spear takedown, which is uh, widely known as a 
Japanese double because it is largely used in Japanese shoot wrestling and in different styles of MMA is really intended to be used when I'm stuck on the inside. Sometimes I'm looking to slip and zone out. I'm performing my jab catch, but the person sees it and instead of just funneling down the pipe, they come out with a hook and they knock your head to the inside and I have to go from there and so my head will be in the zone. Is it more dangerous? Theoretically, yes. But if it's if it's utilized at the correct time, it's completely non-telegraphic. It's completely surprising. I myself will generally use it when I'm in the clinch already and I'm fighting. I'm already tight. In the clinch, it's difficult to make those micro adjustments and to zone out and then get past the arm. If I can't get under the armpit, it can be tough to stuff the arm down and stay on the outside. So oftentimes in a clinch, particularly when I'm myself and stuck in a single or double nape, I'll simply change levels, drive my head sometimes into the chest, or if I can, into the pubis, and go for my double right there. It is difficult with a head spear takedown to perform anything other than a double. A two-on-one is not as likely uh, because the head has to be over on an angle. I need to have my hands apart and my head straight in. And when I perform this takedown, I can sometimes perform it from a fairly narrow base in width, not necessarily in depth, meaning that my legs are quite squished in, but they're still far apart front to back. And I change and I drive almost in complete alignment to put all of my power behind my spine. I can also perform it from a very wide base Base, and then drive my head in, providing my head is in the center, which is aligned with the spine. That's the, that's the default position. What matters most here is that my neck is neutral and stable. Some people will smash in with kind of a bulldog neck like this and hit it. It's not my preference because the face is more open to impact and it puts a lot of strain on the neck. I tend to want to bring my chin down, lengthen the back of the neck, and to drive it. So what I'm going to show you next is a few very, very simple conditioning exercises that you can do to reinforce ideal neck position. Ideally, for the next drill, you want to have a soft surface. So a, a large crash mat is ideal. A padded wall is great. Uh, feeling that, you can wear a boxing headgear, throw a towel over your head. doesn't matter how ridiculous it looks. just want to take away some of the sharpness of the wall itself, particularly if you are bang deficient as I am. This is the idea. You get into your low position. And what I want to do is I want to contact with the, the forehead. So I'm putting the head into the wall. And from there, I want to drive. When I drive, the tendency here is for people to allow the neck to buckle up, to bring the chin too far in. That's why people will default to putting the nose down and pushing. But either extreme is not good for the neck. And here this can be quite dangerous for the upper vertebrae. Here it's more in the lower vertebrae. So I want to find that happy neutral position where I can lean. I can support myself with my hands. But I lean and I, I basically see what it's like to pedal work with the feet, to push away, and to drive. So it is essentially my tailbone bringing up that spinal energy into the crown of the head. And it doesn't need to be dynamic. Again, this is a little bit more uh, demanding, so you want to make sure that you understand the basic mechanics. I can support with my hands if I need to. I can place them across underneath, or I can assume they're on the legs to get the fullest replication of the position. But this simple exercise can be deceptive. You can do this for a few minutes and think it's really not that demanding and really feel the effects afterwards. So you don't want to do a regretful amount the first time, just a minute or two. You can play with the legs being in a, in a tighter alignment, or you can play with the legs being in a wider alignment. But what matters is that my legs are relative to my spine, and my spine is in line with my head, always pushing, very simple pressure. That simple exercise, if you perform it, even for a minute or two, and then you go back to trying it on a partner, you'll see a massive difference in the amount of push that you have. Now, one little detail on the head spear double. When we're performing it, the key things to remember are the basic, basic principles of structure that we've seen so far. If we look at the idea of triangulation, we know that if we pursue movement on 45 degree paths, we'll have the most efficient deviation, manipulation of the center of mass relative to the, the base of sustenance. So if I were in this position and I wanted to get somebody straight down, it is forgivable, natural, normal, and effective to simply take that forehead and to drive it 45 
45 degrees downward straight to the ground, driving the hips on a straight 45 degree downward path, and that is good. However, sometimes with more resistant opponents, stronger opponents, I need to create imbalance. So going back to our level one work, we know that I can, from that position, create some degree of deviation. And this will be done to some degree with the head, but it is largely done from the shoulder mantle, like I'm almost a flying a hang glider or driving a, a huge motorbike. I need to lean in with my shoulders so my head stays as the centered point of rotation, but my nose might turn a little bit to the side, thereby creating one side that is more void and one side that is more dense. Anytime I can lighten the load on one foot and essentially bring the opponent more onto one leg, I'm more likely to efficiently drive them to the ground, to create a void by which I sweep that leg and drop them down. I'm also more likely to stumble them, so sometimes when I'm working, I will do most of the work with my arms as I drive in, and then push down with the head. But directly connected to this, we also have to remember leverage. Leverage dictates that I should have a fixed fulcrum. So the biggest weakness in performing the head spear, and all doubles, or two on ones for that matter, is that people will pull with the hands as they drive with the head. But in reality, the head is the primary pusher. So once I get in there, aside from that small deviation, my hands should be relatively fixed, they become the points of rotation, and my head should be all that's driving. So what I do need to do is absorb my spine into my structure by contracting my shoulder blades together, but I'm not trying to rip the legs up. If I start to rip the legs up as I push with the head, in actual effect, I take the length of the leg and I cut it in half, because now I'm trying to treat the knee as a point of rotation, and that becomes less efficient because I've just halved my lever, and again, that's your level two structural consideration. But the third thing specific to the, uh, the double takedown is that particularly with the head spear takedown, sometimes I can additionally think of uh, my angulation working first on an upward 45 degree. Because my posture is quite straight when I impact, oftentimes I will lift the opponent up via my tailbone. The smallest amount of drive into the pubis to lift them on the toes, thereby allowing a greater and easier deviation and then finally driving down. So it's a small little detail, but what I look to do in my posture is to touch and look up, slightly twist, and then drive straight down to a 45. Touch and look up, slight twist, and drive straight down to a 45. Up like a wave, and then down. And so when I'm coming from a standing position, it's almost like I'm scooping the earth up and then down. And there are many ways to train this. I don't necessarily have to have a head impact. If I'm doing it for a, a basic double with the head on the outside, it would be the same mechanics. But I can shoot into the wall, toes and knee to the outside, hands on the wall, get as close as I can, and then climb up. By this action, I can use the basic leg clinch entry to go into body locks. But if I cut it short, I can then drive down halfway through, creating fakes, creating uncertainty in their center of mass relative to their base, and fundamentally strengthening your essential mobility and capacity in your shoe. Okay, now as we proceed towards the conventional orthodox double leg takedown, I want to make a few distinctions about center of mass and deviation of spine relative to the head positions between the head spear takedown and a conventional double. Here on the ground, I've mapped out with tape the basic lanes of my feet. And what you'll notice is that my feet at the beginning are fundamentally engulfing my opponent, meaning there's one on either side, I'm standing absolutely square. This is not my ideal position, but this is where I found myself. Given preference and choice, I would like to zone out, but as we said with the head spear takedown previously, it's not always possible. So when I perform my basic head spear takedown, what I see is that I have my legs basically around the person's base. They may have their legs in different configurations, but my head is right in the center of the pubis or stomach, and I'm driving up and then downward. When I perform the fundamental double takedown, the difference now is I can still, if I need to, deliver it from the same spot. But if I had a fraction of a second more, I would be rotating my shoulder axis to bring my head to the closest outside leg. And I would be performing that double, driving in, and my head would now be in a preferable, safer position. So from the, the variation is straightforward or 
double outside. Now, some distinctions. Both can be fired from the inside zone if they need to be. The head spear position will tend to be fired from a more narrow position. Very often, if I'm having difficulty, I will drive forward like a torpedo. It can be fired from a wider position, but it's rare that it'll be as wide as a conventional double leg takedown. Double leg takedowns are very difficult to fire with effectiveness from a narrow base. And we tend to get all caught up and it's not as strong. People tend to default to a wider base because in order to create the deviation in the spine, they need to have a wider base to do it. I may be very narrow when spearing because everything's tight, but as soon as I start to bring my head outside, my hips will shift to a degree and my stability is sacrificed. It's much like surfing. You can't really deviate much in your upper stance unless you're countering a wave. If I widen my base, I have a much more forgivable area of play. You look at boxers that slip extremely low and wide, like a Mayweather, they have a very wide base that allows them to snap back and perform larger circles. So it's the exact same thing for an orthodox double, is that my base will tend to be wider, and I'll go in with greater mobility in my head. A second distinction is that the double, if, I can, if I'm seeking to get my head outside, generally I want to be as close to that in my starting point. So rather than being inside, if I had a choice, I would seek to be slightly zoned out. So I'm just taking a, a one foot width step over to the side. From this position, I would never shoot a head spear takedown. If I can already get here, I would seek to stay outside the hand, change levels, and to align my head with the outside of the body. So it can be very helpful, even in my solo drilling, to think of the lanes of my feet beginning first inside and seeing that I can be narrow when I spear, but that I need to be wider if I was going to slip just my head to the outside. Recognizing that if my body's in but my head's out, it's not out by much. It's just out slightly and still in danger. But preferably, if I can slip out just a bit with a wide base and keep my head outside, I would then be in a position for doubles, splits, two-on-ones, and three-on-ones. But I would no longer be in the zone of this head spear take. Now, specifically in the first two takedowns, the head spear and the double, and to some extent to the split, which we'll see next, one very essential detail is regarding the hands. Many people will go in for the takedown with fingers flared. And when the fingers are flared, we tend to waste a lot of energy on squeezing with the hands. And more than that, we endanger the fingers. We can often snag pinkies uh, in the cloth or jam the thumb. So it's very important we have kind of a, a heavy, loose, but still concrete, solid monkey hand with the thumb and the fingers together. So one exercise I like to use in the conditioning is to simply take two weighted balls, something that you can palm easily, and make sure that I'm not gripping it like this. Make sure I'm not gripping it with finger pads or with thumbs in an oppositional uh, opposed form with any kind of space. I'm cupping it entirely like this. So thumbs are alongside the finger. And what I want to do when I'm, when I'm shooting in is whether I'm shooting my, my head spear or whether I'm shooting my double, I make sure that I'm reinforcing that monkey-like scooping action with my hands. More than that, I can also emphasize the bottom axis, the ulnar line of the hands, hacking and scooping in with the bottom side of the arm. Very often people will come into the legs and they come in high and they, they start to pull primarily with the, the, the index fingers. And when that happens, the thumbs are more likely to engage in waste energy. I should just be hooking or hacking and then preferably going low. So the next consideration once the hands are monkeyed in like this is slide them all the way down to your maximum extension, keeping just a little flexion in the elbows and see that you can spear or double. Remember, the hands are a point of rotation. They are a fulcrum. They are not ripping. So you'll become very aware in your repetitions if you're ripping with the arms. If you're pulling, is this little bit of weight is going to emphasize that. Instead, I should be looking to scoop and hack with the bottom, fix the hands, and to drive. Driving my head through or driving my shoulder forward. In the double, the shoulder is fundamentally replacing the role of the head driving into the pubis. Now, you're going to see lots of people that do far more athletic, muscular versions that rip and strip and lift. Some people that pick up and then slam. And by all means, it can be gratifying emotionally. It can be sensational sportively. You get a, a round of oohs and ahs from spectators. But it's not efficient. And if you train yourself to do this, and then you're not able to because of exhaustion or because your opponent's in superior position or too heavy, and you have that 
that reflex, you're going to continue to engage it. Anytime you see people up against the, you know, the side of the cage, pulling and wrestling, and the other person is just neutral and calm, that's a classic example of having trained in a muscular way, and that musculature is now failing you. But people that have trained efficiently will simply migrate to something else, and if it's not working, they stay far calmer, and they conserve their energy. When it's not sport, when everything's on the line, when it is survival, I myself want to have the most efficient options possible and conserve as much energy as I can. to as a split leg takedown. So we saw that we can perform a head spear takedown in the middle. If I'm slightly zoned out and wider, I can place my head on the outside and perform a double. But at this point, if the opponent's back leg is too far for me to reach on the outside, sometimes I can turn the hand over and scoop up on the inside of the leg. Generally, I'm going to cuff just above the flexion, of the, the round of the calf in the flexion of the knee. I want to be cautious never to place my hand in the knee itself, because if I go in the knee joint, and there's any compression, my fingers can be crushed up. So my pinky edge is the highest element that can go towards the knee, and all of my hand needs to be below the knee on the calf. Some people will peel the calf and kind of barrel roll it over like a massage. I've never found I have that much time. I just flick it in, conventional grip on that side, monkey grip inverted on the other side, and I drive forward. In our head spear takedown, the head was the fundamental push in the midline of the body. In the conventional double, the head gets replaced by the shoulder. But when we start to look at the split takedown, sometimes the shoulder slides over a bit, and as I pull, there can be a scooping flexion of the shoulder, and the elbow rather, and the elbow kind of chicken wings up and can hit into the groin. Generally, I'm neutralizing only the front load leg, wrapping that leg and going low, and the second side is fundamentally pushing into the groin and sweeping the void of the leg. So this type of a of a winging action with the arm is something that's very important to isolate. I'm going to show you a very simple exercise to do that next. Now, if you're working on a harder surface, like a cement wall or drywall that you don't want to make a hole in, you can simply align the outside of the arm in this drill rather than hit. What matters is that I'm looking to create a frame, a bent frame with this arm, whereby I'm touching with the outside of the forearm and the outside of the humerus between the tricep and the bicep, right down the center line of the outside of the arm. So I'm looking to have the ability to touch, starting with the back knuckles of the hand, having a bend in the elbow like a robot position, and the shoulder pushing forward forward. So I can do it on the knees, I can do it from a double, it's up to you how you want to train it. But what matters is that I can screw the arm into that propeller and if I do have something softer or uh, the base of a punching bag or a wave master, I can, I can practice popping from that pulling position where my knuckles would be on the mat in this case, but pulling the calf to a, a drive up. And it can be the shoulder or it can be the elbow. But in either case, I'm driving forward in a way that should not hurt me, thinking straight down to that triangulation point. And what often happens after this initial takedown is that I can maintain control of this arm and scoop it over my head, as you'll see in many of the applications, because you know exactly where that arm is going to be. But this little pop is something that you can't safely train uh, repeatedly on your partner's groin, but you can, but you're going to have a hard time finding a training partner. Uh, but it's a simple little detail that really changes the effect of the takedown. of leg clinch takedowns. And all of them have been what we would term a double leg attack, meaning we're attacking both legs. The next two are what are termed single leg attacks, meaning that all of our attention are simply uh, being focused on one leg, generally the front leg. So there are two fundamental variations. When I go down, because either I am unable to reach the other leg or because I simply choose to focus only on the front leg, I will either double wrap the front leg with my arms or in some cases double wrap and then use the foot to assist in hooking, tripping, or delaying the body. Uh, now, the foot. 
What I seek to do in, a, in an essential two-on-one is to rap. Some people will rap with both hands pretty much at the same level. There, there, there's potential in this. It's not my preference. If you do decide to cuff your hands together, whether it be in a palm-to-palm -palm grip or a ball and socket wrist grip, you cannot, should not, have the hands, the arms, at the same level as your shoulder. Because then you're fundamentally pushing very close to your fulcrum and having a very tight scissor with very little leverage. What I would need to do is at minimum have both hands low so that I'm able to drive with the shoulder and have the longest expanse between the fulcrum and the push or the, the active force on the lever. And this will give me the greatest leverage on the leg. My personal preference is to have the hands somewhat split and I'll tend to have one hand low on the ankle, the other one somewhere near the calf or the thigh, just to allow myself to get in tighter and to control it. This prevents flexion, prevents me from getting hit. And then the key there is that the lowest hand is really the pivoting point, the second hand is a bracing leg, uh, arm, and the shoulder is the primary pusher that will push the person down. Here more than ever, we will see that if we start to rip and pull with the arms and the hands, we will have catastrophic difficulties. Most of the times when you, you hear people saying, wow, that defender had great balance, or they're super flexible, or they were really strong, it's because the aggressor was pulling and pushing at the same time, rather than stopping and pushing. So what's extremely important is that I simply place my hands low, or my hands split with my low hand being fixed, and I essentially drive myself over that hand. In the case of a three-on-one, then we can have some exceptions. Sometimes now people will double cuff with both arms high and use the leg low and go forward. There are a number of ways we can do it. It is sufficient to place a knee on the foot or a knee near the outside of the foot to stop the foot. Some people will parallel one uh, or sort of mirror their foot alongside. At minimum, I prefer to at least hook my foot behind the heel, but my absolute preference is to scoop all the way behind the leg quite deeply, arriving on the outer edge of my foot. From here, I essentially fall into a shin box or into a half pigeon. If I don't have that capacity, then naturally it's not going to get magically better when I try this against an opponent. If my legs are not that stable, not that strong, if I'm... not that flexible, not that confident in my knee, I can simply have my hands split and bring my knee alongside the foot and drive over. But the absolute preference, especially for you smaller, more flexible people, have your hands split, hook and drop, and drive forward. Now, the value in any single leg attack is that you're putting greater attention on the one leg. And if you can create that one leg, cause it to buckle, you're more likely to cause the opponent to fall. You should definitely have, in all five of your leg attacks, some follow-up arsenal. So if you fail to get the double, the head spear, the split, the two-on-one or the three-on-one, you will usually have some degree of contact with that front leg. If you do, generally we look to turn around and ride the leg or to return to a standing position and go back to a body lock. If those fail and the front leg rips back, the back leg tends to be further away and you're more prone to get hit. So in that case, I'll generally fall back and, and sort of um, rely more on kicking or striking and wait until I can get up with a tactical stand. Now what's essential for us is that we have some basic familiarity with these five positions. You're not going to like all five of them equally, but if you can ultimately decide that you have one or two preferences, one or two go-tos that you seek, this is essential. From there, if it fails, I need to have some clear idea of where I want to go. Am I going to transmute it or transition to a secondary takedown, a leg ride, a lift? Am I going to climb up to the body and seek a body lock or some other type of takedown? Am I going to fall back into a kicking position or am I going to try to stand up. We should have some basic secondary B plan that we try to get to um, and ultimately whatever we seek to do, we just need to explore these in an open, honest and resistant environment to see that our expectations match our reality. Okay guys, now it is time to take a look at takedown defense. To understand takedown defense, we need to revisit some of the key principles of breaking structure that we've seen so far in the previous three levels. We know that we have our center of mass, which is fundamentally the, the mass of our hips, and we have a base of sustenance, which is the surface area occupied by our feet. To increase our balance, we will generally tend to lower that center of mass and keep it centered 
over that base of sustenance while widening the base to some degree. But there is a point of diminishing returns, wherein if we widen the base too much and lower the center too much, we begin to challenge our flexibility, our capacity to adapt, and we start to lose balance. Overall, the idea of breaking structure is the idea of moving someone's base, of their center of, uh, of mass rather, outside of their base faster than they can adapt. If you're able to move someone's hips outside that base and they cannot stumble quickly enough to calibrate and adapt their, ba their, their, their balance, they'll tend to fall. So when we look at takedowns from a standing perspective, it's all about keeping people away from that center of mass to make it harder for them to affect it. We've seen that it's more difficult to affect somebody's structure by attacking the limbs, what we term tree theory, and that it's always preferable to attack someone's trunk. So at a core level, if we keep people away from our hips and they only have our periphery and our arms, it really is a matter of a clinch fight. And all of the work we saw in our level two clinch fight is the essence of maintaining structure. But when someone does latch on around the torso, when they've basically snared your spine, that's when you're in the greatest danger. And so our fundamental defense now becomes the so-called sprawl, which this is, idea, this is the idea of creating frames and structures to keep the aggressor at bay or to push them back while jacking your hips back as far as possible. Now, not all sprawls are created equally. Many people learn it just as a, as a rote memorization, mirrored technique. They see it, they replicate it. It's modeled without any real detail. And what we see uh, in its worst case is people performing these ballistic burpees, you know, cosmically humping the ground with full energy without any regard for structure. And this is so potentially dangerous, it makes me cringe when I see these videos. Now with the advent of MMA, there's a lot of um, factory cookie cutter churned out techniques. People are turning this type of defense into little more than a, uh, an aggressive Zumba class with people just replicating the movement and having no understanding of how their body works. So we're going to take a little bit of a yogic pause and we're going to revisit uh, the essence of the sprawl. At its core, the sprawl is about getting the hips nice and low. So the cobra stretch remains one of the fundamental educational tools for warming up, strengthening, and maintaining a good and healthy sprawl. If I go down into a low cobra, which means I just have my forearms down on the floor, roughly parallel, I know that I, I should try to avoid having my forearms coming in on any sort of a, a diamond configuration like this because my shoulder blades will now tend to be less stable and uh, oftentimes asymmetrical. So I want them parallel, equally spaced, and all I want to do is relax at first in this posture. When I relax in that posture, most people tend to assume it without any regard for the spine. They simply stretch, they acquire the pose, and then from there they start pushing up and back in all different directions. So the very first thing I want to do is simply feel my posture. Make sure that my toes are pointing in the same direction, generally both inward. If I go both outward, it requires greater hip flexibility, and if I don't have that hip flexibility, it'll put more strain on the inside of the knees, and to some extent the inside of the ankles and the hips. So be cautious. You can start balls of feet if you have, uh, if you're recuperating from leg injuries, um, whether it be in knee, hip, or ankle, or I can try to go inward, which is preferable. And then from that posture, I flare the fingers. And the reason I'm going to flare the fingers is I want to maximize the activation of my forearm, and I want to keep these hands a little bit like suction cups, Spider-Man to the ground, so I have some anchor and some stability. Stability prevents any nervousness, any extra tension, any risk of injury. Now, the most important thing to do at the base level is keep the head neutral. I'm looking at the camera a lot, so my head's coming up and down. But fundamentally, I want to bring my chin down only so low as to lengthen and invigorate the back of the neck. I'm essentially performing the level one spinal check in this posture. I roll my shoulders gently together and squish them a bit so I have a bit of elasticity between them. And finally, and this is the most important step, I curl the tailbone under. So it's not uncommon when I curl the tailbone under in this position that I feel some degree of pressure between my pubis and the floor. And I wanna just maintain that. And then I release. And I practice doing that a few times, just activating the neck, the shoulders, and the pubis, pulling those ribs gently into the spine, and then releasing. After that, you can perform a comparative analysis of an empty, unaware spine simply hanging out and breathing and see what that feels like to breathe into the stomach. The stomach will swell, but because the stomach is inhibited by the ground, you'll start to feel larger degrees of lateral expansion when you inhale. 
And to some degree, many of you will feel it in the lower back as well, which is ideal. I should feel my back somewhat expanding against my waistline, against my belt, but I'm not actively trying to push it against it. I'm not trying to add strain. And then re-engage the spine, neutral neck, neutral shoulders, tailbone under, and repeat. And I should feel a difference. Now, this is an important point, guys. I want to make sure I feel the difference between an empty spine that we're unaware of, that's neglected, that's simply hanging out, and an activated spine that's braced, strong, and neutral. I should never, never seek to have...